So, ladies and gentlemen, we invite you to keep going back for dessert or more drinks or queso. And uh, while you're doing that, we will have a lesson on Exodus. Our theme this evening is the Passover, using the word deliverance. We're going to read that from Exodus chapter 12. It has been greatly edited because it is a long chapter. So we edited, uh, we, we're giving you the most basic parts of Exodus chapter 12. You'll remember the, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. 430 years before this, uh, Joseph had gone into Egypt. The people came there, family came there. They multiplied. Pharaoh got worried. Oh, there are too many of these folks. They might join our enemies and fight us. So they made them slaves, and that's what they had been for many, many decades. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share that with their nearest neighbor. The animals you choose must be your old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Goat raisers, there you go. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Eat it with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand ready to go. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment upon all the gods of Egypt. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days you are to eat bread without yeast. Do no work at all on these days except to prepare food for everyone to eat. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. And then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the doorframe. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe and will pass over that doorway and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat upon the throne to the firstborn of the prisoners who were in the dungeon and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. There was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron, and Pharaoh said, Up, leave my people, you and the Israelites. Go worship the Lord you have requested. Take your flocks and herds and go. And also, 
bless me. So the people took their dough before the yeast was added and carried it on their shoulders in kneading troughs wrapped in cloths. The Israelites journeyed from Ramses to Succoth. With the dough the Israelites had brought from Egypt, they baked loaves of unleavened bread. The dough was without yeast because they had been driven out of Egypt and did not have time to prepare food for themselves. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. <laughs> significant times and significant events can significantly influence how you keep time, how you mark time. There are those in one generation who will say, I remember after the war, speaking of World War II, this happened. Or I remember this, it was just a few days before President Kennedy was assassinated. Or this happened just a couple of days after 9-11. Gen Z doesn't remember 9-11, but some of them will remember the election of Barack Obama. Various things happen, and we mark time by those things. There's a Mennonite professor, Carol Penner, who says, everyone has a before and after moment. As a nation and as individuals, there are watershed moments, before and after moments, by which we mark time. You'll tell the story of your life, and you may say, well, this happened, it was before we moved to Fredericksburg. Or you will remember, you know, that happened after mom broke her hip. Or this happened before I went off to school or to the army. Or that was after we had our first child. Or before COVID. Have you noticed most things were before COVID, but <laughs> you can't tell if it was like a year or 10 years before COVID. But you'll think of significant events, and by that you will mark other times in your life. We have events that give our lives before and after moments and memories. And so our Bible reading this evening is about an event like that. Israel delivered from Egypt. Deliverance from years and years of slavery. The Hebrew people prepare a meal that is called Passover. It tells us in that reading tonight it will be roasted lamb. I'd rather have Dwight A. Strike hamburgers, but that's <laughs> not what the, that was not an option. It will be roasted lamb, bitter herbs, and unleavened bread. And then God, they have to be ready to go. They eat it in haste. They eat it standing. And then they're going to have to leave because God's going to lead them on an exodus, an exit from slavery. We call that deliverance. Before and after kind of event. In fact, the rest of the Old Testament will, in fact, mark most things by whether this happened before Moses or after Moses, before or after the Exodus. And there will be an established Passover meal that remembers and specifically, symbolically tells the story of this event, this deliverance. The Exodus of God's people from Egypt is the greatest redemptive story in the Old Testament. Christians, of course, speak of the cross of Jesus Christ as the New Testament most redemptive event. In fact, we would say for all of life and that the cross, the cross stands for the death and resurrection of Jesus and that is the great redemptive act of history. It's how we mark time even and how we keep our dates. But before the cross, there was the exodus. The Jewish people knew God first and foremost as the one who had led them out of Egypt with a mighty hand, an outstretched arm. In fact, God, when God introduces himself in the uh, Old Testament time and time again, and when he reminds people, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. 
He delivered them from Pharaoh and he would deliver them into the promised land. It is only after they know God as deliverer that it will occur to them later that, oh, yes, he's also our creator. God is also the lawgiver. They only knew that in retrospect decades, even centuries, after they knew God as deliverer. Tonight, we remember the Passover meal, which in itself is a remembrance of the Exodus, when God had raised up a leader and deliverer named Moses. Interesting, Moses barely made it. As a child, when he was a baby, the Pharaoh at that time had ordered the massacre of all Hebrew boys. But Moses was hidden, and he came through that time, was even raised in Pharaoh's household. And so now the judgment is returned upon Egypt, as the firstborn must die. Kind of reminds us also of, of 1,300 years later when there will be a massacre of innocent children after the birth of Jesus. It will be ordered by Herod. So Moses is raised up. Moses, understand, did not lead them in an escape. An escape is a totally different thing. An escape is something you do yourself. I escape. I am able to do it myself, but not so with deliverance. And the exodus is not an escape. It is the deliverance of Israel. Deliverance, again, it's not, that's not something you do yourself. Escape is, but not deliverance. And so God delivers. God's people were slaves. God intervened. And God snatched them out of Pharaoh's hand and out of Pharaoh's power. The people of Israel never wanted to forget this deliverance. The exodus was their big before and after event. And that shaped their relationship with God forever. It also affects how we know and understand God. As Christians, we trust that Jesus Christ is the one who brings our exodus, our exodus from sin and judgment and death. He is the one also that will bring us to an eternal promised land. Without blinking an eye, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And when John the Baptist sees Jesus coming down to the river and he tells the crowd, look, behold, there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Carol Penner, again to quote her, she notice, notices that deliverance is surprisingly diverse amongst people. I can give you some examples. For example, we, we know people who are thankful that God has delivered them from some kind of heavy guilt, from some past sin. We did something that was wrong, and we regret it. We're sorry for that. But the guilt just seems to weigh down upon us. Sometimes it seems almost unbearable. We, we often give the past a lot louder voice than it deserves. And that guilt can weigh us down. But Jesus forgives our sin. And there is a, a sense of relief when that guilt falls away, and that is something that, that we as Christians are given, the forgiveness of sin and the taking away of guilt. A lot of hymns celebrate songs and passages about deliverance. Strong deliverer will sing in just a little bit. There's another kind of deliverance. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus gives his mission statement. He says, as he is in the synagogue, I have come to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go free. That was his mission. And he offered it to the people he ministered to. And he offers it also to us, that kind of deliverance, a freedom from some kind of, some kind of captivity, some kind of slavery that we may be in. There's another more literal kind of deliverance, 
There are people who have been trapped in in habits or in ways of living that have been destructive or have been hurtful in some way, and God delivered them. Sometimes it's almost miraculous, a craving that they've had for years and years for, for a drug ceases. Or a a person who has been enslaved by power of alcohol and not able to control it, suddenly they feel healed. God breaks the power of money or coveting, or you can make a whole list of things that try to enslave us or make us uh, an addict of some sort. Other people... Tell about a different kind of deliverance, a a transformation in their outlook on life. They may always have thought one way, but then God does something, and there's something in their life that changes, and they are able to think another way. Their outlook on life has changed, and it is a deliverance. They were self-centered or selfish previously, but God changed their life and set them free from some kind of prison that they had been in. And they become filled with a love for humanity. Another one, deliverance from despair. Despair is is when you have an overwhelming feeling of your problems or your troubles. And it seems like there is no way out. And now... God has some way delivered them, and they see, they see God's hand guiding or protecting or leading them in some direction. As John Newton said, they were lost, but now are found. They were blind, but now they see. These are great before and after testimonials. So, the Passover is a freedom story. When you read the book of Exodus, there, well, Exodus has a lot of disasters and a lot of deliverance. It has a lot of oppression and injustice, and it has a lot of saving also. We learn that God does not want slavery. God does not want oppression. That is not God's will. God wants freedom. And that's a message that's worth passing on. For 3,000 years, over 3,000 years, the Jewish people have celebrated the Passover meal generation after generation after generation. We've had these meals during Lent. For 3,000 years, they've had Passover. They eat lamb and unleavened bread. They drink glasses of wine during the meal. That's what they were doing the night that Jesus and his disciples got together for for his last supper. And when Jesus transformed that Passover meal into what we now call the Lord's Supper, Pastor Kevin will talk about that next Monday, Thursday. As the Hebrew people would leave and as they would go out of Egypt, they would have to pass through the waters of the Red Sea. And so we also as Christians pass through the waters of baptism. And once you pass through those waters, you've got to eat. They had their meal and and we have our, our Lord's Supper, the bread and the wine of communion. We eat and drink. We remember and we live into and we are nurtured by God's grace. We, of course, don't paint the blood of a lamb on our door frames anymore. But we live under the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on that cross on Calvary. And the angel of wrath passes over us. It's a promise. That is, you know, the greatest before and after story ever told. It's one we will go through next week on Good Friday and, and Easter Sunday, the cross and the resurrection. Here's the thing I want to close with. The Passover story is told in both the past tense and the present tense. God freed us and God frees us, continues to free us. And there's a future tense.
Did that microphone just go out? That's okay, this is the last sentence. <laughs> it is deliverance into a promised land where we shall gather around the throne of Jesus. Lamb of God, who has passed over from death into life. Amen. Say it again for the live stream. We're also not going to pick it up on the live stream. Okay, I'll say this again. God freed us, and God is freeing us, both present and past tense. And there's the future tense, the deliverance into a promised land where we shall gather around the throne of Jesus, the Lamb of God, who has passed through death into life. Amen.